Can you feel it? 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 Can you feel? Can you feel it? 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 Can you feel? Can you feel it? Hello, friends. Welcome to Forza the podcast that dives in to explore the nature and experience of being alive. I'm your host, Tracy Brinock, performance artist, writer, researcher, mother, lover, all round deep diver into embodied experience. What does it feel like to be alive? How can I describe it and communicate it? How can we learn from each other's experiences of aliveness? In the series, I talk with a wide variety of guests, artists, activists, educators, spiritual teachers, writers, guides, shamans, to find out more about their experiences of the force, life force, energy of life, elixir of life, source, whatever we might call it. I hope it brings something new to your experience of being alive. Can you feel it? 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 Feel it, feel it, feel it, feel it, feel it, feel it, feel it. A warm welcome to Mollera, who's my guest on this series. Mollera is an inspirational, multi-talented female force. She's a visual artist, a poet, participatory artist, activist, mother, and internationally known for her career as a singer with Zion Train for 14 years. I met Mollera when I worked in West Wales many years ago, and I loved instantly her capacity to speak her truth with everyone. In 2020, she was one of the brilliant artists who worked with me on my project Here Now, A Manour, and as part of this, she composed the Can You Feel It theme song, which we're using for this podcast series. I hope you enjoy listening to our conversation. So, Malara, thank you so much for coming and speaking with me today. And I also want to say a personal thank you for providing the vocals for the beginning of this series, the Can You Feel It, which came out of our last piece of work together. Yes. Um, so there's there's so many things I'd like to start with. Um, you know, the, the theme of, of this series is exploring life force and what it means to people. And, and particularly, I think for me as a performance artist, I'm interested in how tangible that is and how that's something we can grow and not just in ourselves, but with others also. Um, and so I'd love to know, particular, I'm thinking as, as a singer, um, you know, performing for thousands of people over decades, um, can you describe some of those experiences when you felt, you know, completely alive in that sort of heightened setting? Definitely. I mean, I started singing with Zion Train in 1990 well I joined the band towards the end of 1991 and then we started gigging really in 1992 and there were you know the first few gigs were were what they were they were kind of insecure and a little bit ropey and a little bit what are we doing and what is this um, but I knew that it was a it was a group of people, a collective of people that were committed to being vegetarians, were committed to being politically active, were committed to talking about ecology and all of those kind of things. So you kind of had a, a feeling of, yes, this is where I want to be. But then sort of fast track a kind of a couple of years light, for example, um, the first time we played at Glastonbury, um, Glastonbury 1994, and there are still people that talk to me about that gig. It was um, at the side of what was the Jazz World stage then. And literally, whenever I, whenever I went on stage, 
I never went on with a plan of, oh, I am going to sing this song or I am going to sing that song. It was always whatever song was going to come into my head. And I was always going to say things that were political. My sense of injustice, part of my life force, is my sense of injustice of being a black person raised in this country and being abused verbally and sometimes physically from a very early age. So my sense of injustice, social injustice, all of that, all of that is very much tied in with what I would say was my life force. So you'd get to Glastonbury 94, two o'clock in the morning after the sound systems were all supposed to have been switched off in a tent heaving full of people who were all just going absolutely crazy and saying things that I believed in. I believed that, you know, the Criminal Justice Act was a disgrace. I believed that we should be one world, one people, one love. Um, and I was always very, very vocal about those things and to be with a group of people that that inspired and I was always leaping around the stage, you know, so definitely those times. There was a, there was a time, the first time we played on the John Peel stage and we'd met John Peel, who I absolutely had adored from being a teenager and who, got, who I got to interview once, once and one as well, which was also brilliant. But... Um, there was a police helicopter, Helicopter. there was about 46,000 people, all of whom I was just on down the mic, we've got to come together, we've got to unite, we can't take any more stuff, and there's a police helicopter. So I told 46,000 people to flick the visa, a police helicopter, which they all turn around and did. Um, so yeah, there's those, there's those kind of wild nights, could be Poland, could be in Warsaw, the, the energy of people who had been repressed for so long, say in Czech Republic, in Poland, was also always just, it kind of matched your energy and you bring fire and they give you fire right back. And I think those times of civil disobedience and of, of wanting to live in a world where there actually was unity and harmony and people did respect each other, that, that kind of is, very much tied in with with those moments it's not about just about the music or the singing it's about the interaction with the audience and I think that's when my life force is at its most mm. powerful raging fire <laughs> it's like the kind of the fire starter the ignition for all of that feeling in in the room or in this the stadium yeah yeah you you lift that and and everybody connects to it yeah, yeah. And I think, yeah, that, that, that does make you feel like you're in the right place at the right time. As it's, I, I always talk about my life was not a life of belonging. There are not places that I belong. I don't belong in this country. I don't belong in Nigeria. Um, but those moments on stage are moments where I belong. I belong on that stage and I belong with those people. You know, so that's 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 very. I, I hadn't quite realised that, but actually, yeah, that's that's a fascinating, fascinating thing for me to explore further mm. at some point down the line. <laughs> and I, I'm curious as to how how you know that. I mean, what does that feeling of belonging? What does it feel like to to feel in that moment? And it might be just a split second moment of knowing it or for an entire set that you're playing of knowing you belong here with these people in this place at this time. Yeah, it just feels like, what can you say? I mean, belonging, how do you, how do you generate belonging? You can't generate belonging for yourself. It's not, it's not like, um, it's not an intellectual construct. Mm. I belong here. I, I wrote a poem recent. Oh, I wrote a poem. I started writing a poem a long time ago, which I finished recently, which starts with the words, black bitch, coon, nigger, oyimbo, sice. People call me names wherever I choose to live my life. Um, home is where the heart is. Heart you, heart you hope is strong when it's you alone that generates the moments you belong. So that's how I feel. That's, I've never... I've never felt like I fitted in. I've got a great group of friends from school and a great group of friends from uni. And in moments with them, I belong with them in those moments. But in my day-to-day -day life, there's not very many moments of belonging. So those moments of being on stage with a group of, 
You can say that they were like-minded people, but not everybody in the room was a like-minded person, you know. But at that moment when we were all dancing together and, and I was always very conscious that it was, it was like an intangible moment in time that you all were just together, just sharing, sharing a, a genuine freedom, I think, a freedom of spirit, a freedom of energy, whether you, it was me leaping around the stage or them leaping around the tent or whatever. There was, it was a feeling of, of unity and of, of, a, of a joint purpose and a joint desire and a joint freedom, I guess to say what we thought and to be who we were and to dance how we wanted to dance and to look how we wanted to dance. There was an acceptance, I think, in those moments. And um, yeah, it's, it's important. It's important for all of us to have that kind of expression. I think we live in a, in a society that represses our creativity from a very early age, represses us physically from a very early age. So having those moments of wildness, and they are wild, are, are, are great. Mm. Yeah, I, I, um, I also think the more repression there is, the more extreme the wildness that's needed, because we always need the balance. We need both. Yeah. And so having these edge places like music festivals where we're right on the edge of all of the laws, the rules, what's allowed, you know, the curfews aren't there. Everything is broken down. The social structure is different. Yeah. So we can be freer. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And what about the come down, you know, afterwards then coming out of those heightened spaces where you have this sense of belonging, this sense of freedom, this sense of connection to others, this joint vision of purpose, you know how how over the years did that um stay with you or change in the days and weeks afterwards you know the sort of those moments of you know your your heart singing out of of what is your absolute truth and your belief of what the world should be one people one love one world and then emerging out and that's not the way it is still you know, how do you resolve that and how, how did that play out for you? I don't think you can be, you can be idealistic, but I don't think, I don't think you come out, I, I don't think I ever step out of that purpose. There are moments where I kind of feel defeated, but I feel like whatever you might call it, my fighting spirit or whatever is usually there somewhere. So it, and I think you've got to, if you're not, if you're not sort of wrapped up in all of that, then you've got to enjoy whatever those moments are. If you're getting back in a van to drive back to London, then it's a bit challenging. But if, if you go into a tent and you just got to chill or whatever, I just think you've got to, you've got to make space for your own head to kind of just chill and to just calm you know you can't you can't just walk off the stage and just think oh god I feel flat or whatever um I, I just don't think it I don't think it works that way I don't think it's constructive I think you have to try to carry some of that energy that you felt and that you've generated and know that that's something precious to carry with you rather than just going oh well isn't this you know back to the real world you know and you look for those you look for those moments in the real world that are are positive moments or that are funny moments or that are moments that you share with other people you know I think you've you I try to it's not always possible to stay positive but I do try to stay positive I can yeah I think it's I think it's very important for you for your kind of your well-being really to try and find a balance to know that you know that positive is not balanced with negative necessarily you know there's there's other things that you can you can put into the balance with those moments yeah I love that word of regenerating or generating so actually something new is also born in us in those experiences yes uh, that sustains us nourishes us grows us literally exactly exactly yeah, yeah. 
Um, and then I'm I'm wondering um, about whether there are experiences in your life or periods in your life where it's not been possible for whatever reasons to connect to that kind of generation, internal generation, um, and how you've managed that or, or where you draw on resources outside of you to support you to, to navigate those times. Yeah, that's a difficult one, really, because, uh, yeah, I mean, there's been there's been moments like that. It's funny, I remember um, I'd kind of, I'd passed through the awful phase of secondary school and I'd met up with a great group of people um, and one of whom, Sasha, was my particularly my best friend at those times. She was in my year at school and she just was, she just was great. She was very grounded and, and very sarcastic, you know, Northern humour all the way. Um, and I just remember we were, we were in CND and I was concerned about the end of the world with nuclear destruction and all that kind of thing. And I remember this day at school where it was the day where I realized the world was shit and I was absolutely inconsolable. I literally, I had to go, I got sent home from secondary school. I was probably aged, I think I was about age 15. And um, I, yeah, I was, I was just convinced that everything was rubbish and it was all gonna be dreadful. And what about nuclear disarmament? And what about, you know, the Americans? And what about this and what about that? And kind of having that sort of meltdown was almost like, a moment of acknowledgement of, of everything that could oppress you. And then the next day I was all right, you know. <laughs> I'm sure it was a very up and down period of my life, obviously, but at the same time, it was having that acknowledgement that actually there are lots of really terrible things about the world, but they don't have to oppress you every day in every way. Um, there have been other kind of periods that have been horrific. Um, sometimes like if you've got a really dreadful health issue and you're waiting for results for that, or um, you've had a relationship that's broken down and you just feel completely bogged down with that. And then the, the worst kind of incident in my life was when my cousin was killed by the police. Um, having, we'd sent him to a mental health setting because he was, that was the best place for him, you know, a hospital. And um, long story short, he was restrained to death, handcuffed across his face, two sets of leg restraints, 11 police officers took it in turns. Um, and, you know, th those sorts of, that sort of week of waiting, and then we had to decide to turn the machines off because he was brain dead, because they'd been you know, and then you wait seven years to get an inquest and then you find out the true horrific nature of how he died and and all of those things. It, it, at those times, you just have to live through those times. There's no, there's no sugarcoating stuff like that. You just have to live through that time and you have to live with that anger that is always there to a degree. And you just have to find ways of trying to express that positively, I think. I think that would be my key, is to try to express everything positively and try to express everything by getting people to take a look and getting people to, to change, to change their doing or their thinking or whatever it is they need to change to be more tolerant, to be more accepting, to be more, to live in a world that is 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 supportive to everyone, really. Yeah. Yeah, I I relate to uh, that teenage girl who <laughs> discovered, <laughs> oh no, this is the world and uh, the helplessness of like. I'm not going to be able to fix it all, basically. Or what yeah. are we going to do? We, there's nothing we can do. And I see that in, you know, even more so now in a sense where, where we're looking at things like climate change, which is impacting every human and every creature and our landscapes. And we know the science and we know what's going to happen. And I, I see people 
physically weighed down by almost the burden of carrying this and carrying it really in our heads of like we have the information and and maybe we have uh no power to do anything about it or to fix it so it's becomes this heavy thing that we carry and recently I, I was speaking with a friend and and I was talking about how I how I've just changed the way I think about those things now because I I realize worrying and thinking is not doing anything all it's doing is diminishing who I am and how I can show up in the world and how much I can do and give and help. And so I read the facts, I listen to the stories, and then I work out what I can do, where I am with what I have, you know, and that accepting there are other people in the world who are also able to offer something. And I, I don't have to take it all on this sort of very young view again of in my head that I'm going to be responsible and I feel pressure exactly um, yeah. yeah and I remember in that period going to my mum and saying oh well I might as well just commit suicide it's all terrible and she said you selfish cow <laughs> you know very northern working class you know what you know what and I think that it, it is that you can't afford to let those oppressive things crush you because if you do you're not going to be able to make that change. You're not going to be able to support others to make that change. You know, it's not possible to be positive 24 seven, but feeling oppressed or repressed or crushed, you, it, it just, yeah, it doesn't make, it doesn't, it doesn't make your life, your time on, on the planet, doesn't make it special, doesn't make it precious, doesn't make it as valuable as it could be. Hmm. Well, you talked about your cousin and how the anger can be there for so long, you know, and I know the impact that anger has on our physical bodies, on our immune system, and this need to be able to express it, that in some way that that is transforming something in you through what you can offer how important is your creativity your writing your visual art your singing in expressing but also some sort of inner transformation for yourself in these really difficult experiences um totally and it's really interesting because from about 1991 to 2018 my focus has been other people's creativity and supporting them with their projects or you know I'm very passionate about whatever I do whether it was Rots DC or Emmanuel Tago or um, Zion Chain etc etc you know Zion Chain was a, a space for me to express my creativity as well but in our day-to-day -day kind of existence not not so much um, and I'm always the person that felt responsible for the cleaning and the decorating and the shopping and the homemaking and all of those kind of things. And then this last kind of couple of years, it's been like, it's almost been like, oh, I've been looking downwards, but actually now I'm looking up and I'm like, wow, okay. I, there's an amazing woman called Akula Agbami who um, works with black artists on the move. And I started going to, she's done a, a course called African Homecoming. So every week we look at a different African country and we write poetry. She gives us instructions about what to write, how to write this, to write that, to write. And yeah, we, uh, that has been an amazing form of expression because I've written, I've written songs in the past, you know, a handful of songs, but the last three years I've probably written about 60 to 80 songs and in the last what five months since I've been doing maybe oh, actually no I've probably been doing it for about nine months African Homecoming I've written hundreds of poems as well and then she also asked me to do a film about an artist for uh, Black History Month last October and um, 
I decided to do Jean-Michel Basquiat because a friend of mine, a lovely friend of mine, Lou, who taught my son at Pembrokeshire College said that he might be into Basquiat. And for some reason, Basquiat thought was going to be some poncy French bloke, you know. So I rock up to the Barbican with my son, Finn, who's an obsessive Aspikid drawer. And there's this, you know, 10 foot picture of a black bloke with dreadlocks. And I'm like, oh, all of a sudden I'm like, oh, Basquiat, okay. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we just went around this exhibition and his life force was amazing, you know, into music, into hip hop, um, had the television on in the background and um, wrote, or had hieroglyphs and all these sayings and adverts and graffiti and, and just this rich tapestry of inspirational stuff, you know? And, um, and I just, I started making visual art for the first time in 30 years. So this, this kind of the time of the, the, the pandemic has possibly been the most creative time that I've ever had in my life, possibly, because I have been working and I have been inputting into other people, into my students' creativity. I teach performing arts at College Plus Dubal. But um, investing in my own creativity and sewing and realising I love to put different textures of fabric together. So I'll have a velvet. I love um, different West African design fabrics as well. Um, so yeah, it's been, that's been amazing. And, and I, I started off making Basquiat cushions because I make cushions. And then I'd, I'd sewn this cushion and my mum was like, that's not a cushion, that's a piece of art. And that kind of allowed me to chuck sequins on it and beads on it and scrumpled up pieces of metal on it. So yeah, my um, my Basquiat film and my Basquiat collections are um, something that I'm really proud of, as well as my book of poetry that I contributed to with my other group of women writers. So yeah, watch this space for whatever I see next. <laughs> Well, I, I feel it. I feel the energy now as you speak it and hear you describing all of these things, this kind of aliveness that, that comes in us. So, so the artwork, the creativity, again, is regenerating. It connects us back to that kind of source within us to open us and, um, and we get to erupt and flow. And <laughs> everybody who meets you and hears this or sees your work gets some of that. It's that ignition again that you started off talking about when you're on the stage in a sense of when you give the invitation to to 64,000 people you know the same <laughs> thing the invitation is still there I wonder if if you might like to read us a poem if if you have anything to hand oh, yeah I could definitely um I, I absolutely love fabric and I've got the most crazy um collection of fabric um and um, this, yeah, this poem is kind of about um, black history, about being, a, 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 I think if we talk about sort of repression, I think we're all repressed from birth, repressed physically, you know, we, we're taught to move a certain way, to speak a certain way, to be a certain way, to not be creative, to, to buckle down and get jobs and get married and get this and get that. And I, and I, this, this poem is about, fashion and kind of encapsulates all of that and ecology and, and everything else or sustainability. It's called fashion. The greatest destruction of all poisons the earth with synthetic rags. Wherefore my Ashoki, Sidrashi and Kente monetized Dutch wax, livelihoods, traditions fallen through the cracks doomed to a life of jeans, gloomed to a wardrobe of drab, trash our culture and roll out the crimpoline queens, terraline dreams and violine. An interwoven commonwealth of repression, devoid of expression, sees us relegated to the back seats. Primitive, tribal, garish, crude. Patterns are busy, they don't poll well. 
spat out, forsaken, omitted, despised. If I wanted to rhyme, I'd say, open your eyes. Blue, black, brown, gray, khaki, beige, stone, cream, torp. The emperor's new clothes, the length of the catwalk. I can't breathe in clothing with no pepper, no spice, rags of enslavement devoid of past life, textiles with erectile dysfunction, strangulated ties, the castrated remains, as suits whimper in the sidelines while coke adds strife. We're crushed by tidal wave after tidal wave of fashion, adornment with no meaning or passion. Kiss my sword, polyester investors. It reminds me of the day we were on the beach last October. And um, so for people who are aware, we had a collaboration last year with some funding from the Arts Council of Wales to make a, a performance, which ended up on the beach in, in the context we were working in. And um, it was just about six or seven of us meeting socially distanced and the the word I'd emailed out was come in natural colors you know we'll blend in with the landscape blues and greens and grays exactly that list of colors you've just listed <laughs> and when you were arrived you were like I've just read the email but it's black history month so I'm I'm rocking up in my in my passions and I just loved it I loved that you did that but yeah, you know, again, it's about layers of repression for me. I grew up in a world where everything that was black was crap. So to me, to go to Nigeria and discover amazing percussion made from the, the rejects of animal nuts, you know, uh, the, the nuts that um, elephants eat, um, and to discover talking drums and, um, you know, gourds, lampshades made out of gourds with beautiful patterns on you know it just was amazing and I know I'm sitting here in a black jumper today but I kind of made this pact with myself to never be oppressed by what I wear and never feel like I need to fit in with what I wear you know and I also have to give a nod to John Cooper Clark because he's one of my one of my heroes who I was luckily lucky enough to meet as well and I'm sure he plays a part in my poetic voice, definitely. <laughs> Great, thank you. So I wanted to finish if you could just uh, share with us how, how you plug in when you need to regenerate. Uh, your creativity is one thing, but whether there are any other personal practices or community practices that, that you draw on to, you know, to, to, to connect when, when you need to, when you need something outside of yourself I think nature is just epic and um you know I I kind of always look back to um original peoples original religions which were tied in with nature and tied in with the seasons and and a, and a worship of that nature and an acceptance that we were, we were, and I say were very deliberately, part of it. Um, I'm a big fan of Bethany Hughes and the work that she does on um, Venus Aphrodite and female empowerment and, and how organised religions have kind of repressed females as well in, in, in many ways. Um, never mind white God and white Jesus and their repression of of black people so I take I take a lot of you know going to Canada I went to Canada with my kids um we did some gigs and then me and my cat my kids drove through the Rockies and saw a bear and water rushing water you know the waterfalls and I'm very respectful and very scared of water in some ways but also you know lakes and um rivers I just I find all of those things enthralling and stars and the moon and and space I'm so lucky to live in Pembrokeshire and to have the space particularly in the last year to just be able to oh the sun's shining right I'm going to step outside and I'm going to I'm going to plant a, a plant and I've got seven acres of land and gradually kind of a, a meter at a time <laughs> I'm trying not to tame it because I, I want it to be wild and I want it to attract bees and I want it to attract birds but um just to be 
to be as 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 enriched as it can be as well you know so yeah nature my kids um hanging out with them having a laugh um telly I do like telly as a reset but I like things like yeah I'm not I don't can't do soap operas I can't do anything with kind of trauma built in that that always destroys me but I do love I love nature documentaries love David Attenborough um like a bit of David Olashoga um yeah those sorts of things I kind of fi find recharge my batteries um sewing you know not not as creative in some ways but actually probably not sewing though I kind of feel like now that I, what I want to do is to pay someone else to do the sewing and I just put together all the bits of material and ribbon. <laughs> so yeah, I think I think having that a groundedness on the planet is very important and taking inspiration from from those things. Yeah, and zoning out. Music, I didn't even mention music. Oh my days. Yeah. And dancing. I love a dance. Um, uh, when I first met you in Pembrokeshire, uh, you were still that force in the community of bringing groups together and starting things and pioneering. And how important is is a much smaller local community now in comparison to the communities you talked about at the beginning? How important is community to you? Yeah, it's it's weird because I say I've got a lot of acquaintances in Pembrokeshire but few really, really close friends. I love my close friends that I have here. Um, and I feel like my job, my, my name, Omolera, it means children are our strength. So I've always felt that need to kind of uplift other people and uplift those around me and to, and to shout for those people whose voices I don't feel are as heard in the community or as respected in the community as they should be. So I've just finished a project called Pembrokeshire Story for the Torch Theatre. And that's been great because um, I've been able to incorporate some of the work that I did for Race Council Cymru and the, the Welsh Equality, Race Equality Action Plan um, and talk to people who've been traumatised really by their kind of school experience here in Pembrokeshire or speak to um, somebody originally Kanchi, Kanchi's Kitchen originally from Sri Lanka who's cooking up a storm in Narbeth or um, lovely Seren Lewis who has friends with mental health issues so wants to be a music therapist and has taken up looping having seen Camilo Menyura from um, Colombia at the Narbeth Acapella Voice Festival. So I always feel like those connections and, and and uplifting those people who don't necessarily have a voice within our community or people to champion them. I always feel like I have to champion people within the community. I feel like that's part of my role. <laughs> mm -hmm. Does it does it feed you to have that or just sort of think you it must that? do. Yeah it must do or I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. And especially in a time where I feel like I'm investing a lot in my own creativity then actually to be paid to live uplift other people is fantastic that's fine by me that works <laughs> beautiful well thank you so much for having a chat and um, it's great finding out more about you as well I've really enjoyed hearing I know that as soon as we stop recording I think oh I didn't mention that <laughs> but yeah that's fine <laughs> can you feel it? 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 Can you feel? Can you feel it? Can you feel?